Willkommen zurück. Welcome back to the second day of This is not Greece. Um, and I'm very happy to start this um, second day after the discussion last night about the, um, the image of uh, Greece in the German media with sort of very specific analysis of one media event in Germany um, with Sreto Horvat, who is an author and curator and one of the central figures of the new left in post-Yugoslavia and uh, is um, called one of the most exciting thinkers of the best of left of today. He's a columnist for several newspapers and his articles regularly appear in The Guardian, Al Jazeera, Il Manifesto, El Pais and The New York Times. And he wrote several books, of one I would only uh, like to point out one that he uh, co-authored with Slavoj Žižek, What Does Europe Want? The Union and Its Discontents, Was Will Europa, Rett uns von den Rettern. He founded in 2008 the, the Subversive Festival in Zagreb with lectures, film screenings and discussions where amongst others, others Tsipras, Zizek, and Chantal Mouf have spoken. Chantal Mouf also will appear actually here in Hamburg in the Summer Festival on, Wednesday, uh, on the 8th, 19th of August with a lecture on which future for democracy in the post-political age. Um, and uh, the Subversive Festival is also the original site of the middle finger, um, of which we, he will talk about today. Um, so I'm very curious about um, the lecture that he will present, um, where he will sort of start with the middle finger and then expand on, um, to, to try to give a perspective um, on what lesson could the left learn from Zirica. Ja, hallo, vielen Dank für die schönen Wörter. Uh, am Anfang an muss ich mich Entschuldigung entschuldigen. Uh, das ist der Grund, warum ich nicht in Deutsch, Deutsch sprechen werde, weil es mir viel leichter ist, in Englisch zu sprechen. Aber später können wir uh, gerne die Diskussion in, in, auch in Deutsch oder eine andere Sprache führen. Uh, so, was gemacht, der Lena Kiertich, ja, sicher. Creation, or something like that. So, anyway, I'll turn to English. Uh, when I was invited, uh, and thanks to the organizer for, for the kind invitation to be here, uh, when I was invited, it was of course in the context of the scandal provoked by the middle finger showed in Zagreb by uh, Yanis Varoufakis, who was then still not the, the Minister of Finance, but when the scandal was provoked, he was at that moment the Minister of Finance. Today he's not anymore the Minister of Finance. So you see already in these uh, several months, uh, three things changed. And uh, so the title of, of my intervention today is Varoufakis Middle Finger and the, uh, the original idea was actually to present the context and also the meaning of the middle finger. Uh, but what, in the meantime, as you know, the situation changed again. Uh, actually, I just arrived now from Croatia, but before I lived almost uh, the whole month of July in Athens, in Greece, where I was following the situation as other people from the left did. Uh, and uh, the only thing I can say about it, although I will unfortunately say even more, uh, is a saying uh, which is famous among uh, uh, scientists who are really into serious geography. So they say, if you go to a country for one week, you will return home with a book. If you go to a country and stay there for one month, you will return home and write an article. If you stay in a country for one year, you will probably go home and write nothing. I was in Greece one month. Unfortunately, I have published, I, I've written one article uh, two days ago for a Norwegian journal, just because they, they kindly asked me. And this is actually my first lecture on the topic of Greece after arriving from Greece and after all the things which happened in Greece uh, during the last month. Uh, so I'm mentioning this saying uh, from geography uh, because I really have uh, 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 this feeling that it's very difficult to, to speak about Greece. Uh, it's difficult on the one hand for people who were not in Greece during to July, but I would say it's even more difficult, difficult for the people who were there and who are in one way or the other uh, involved. So, what I want to do today, although it's, a, it's pretty difficult, uh, is actually in a way to avoid all the internal discussions uh, about Syriza. Uh, on Syriza left platform uh, exit or stay in the European Union. Although I will, of course, come to this terrain as well because it's not possible not to speak about it. 
but I want to make two main points, and uh, uh, we will come back to the middle finger of Varoufakis in this context as well. Uh, my first point is that already in late February this year, and especially in March, with Yao, uh, something which I describe as the first attempt of a coup d'etat happened. And I would, I would go so far to say uh, it was an attempt of a media coup. I don't know how you call it in, in German, Staatsstreich, uh, so when I say coup, I, I think about the Staatsstreich. Uh, and second, I would say what happened in July is finally a real coup d'etat. So, recently, uh, someone, and you, will, you can guess who it is, uh, made the following comment. comment. Uh, and it was just uh, several days uh, after uh, the Greek parliament accepted to sign a new third bailout, a new memorandum. So he, this guy said, the atmosphere is a little similar to the time after 68 in Europe. I can feel maybe not a revolutionary mood, but something like widespread impatience. I don't know if you can guess who said this, you, some of you probably know. So it's not a radical leftist who said this, that the atmosphere now after what happened in Greece is very similar to 68, uh, but it is no one else but the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk. Uh, and he warned about the ideological and political contagion caused by the recent development in Greece, and he added, quote, when impatience becomes not an individual but a social experience of feeling, this is the introduction for revolutions. So I think this is really a remarkable quote because it's not given by someone like us, but it's given by someone who is one of the leaders of the Eurozone. And to give the first provocation today, I think uh, Donald, we should listen to Donald Tusk. And I, I, I think uh, uh, it is Donald Tusk who takes the left more seriously than the left itself. <coughs> and this is our paradox today. But, let's come to the beginning. I think that this sort of ideological and political contagion uh, started in, in, in late February. So you probably all remember this, but let's show it for the people who don't, who don't remember it. Germans, we are honest, trustworthy people. We are hard as steel, tough as leather. Fast as hounds. Always right on time. We are afraid of nothing. Some of our most famous national dishes are stuffed pig stomach, blood sausage, and roast horse. We are known around the world for our beautiful and melodic yet easy to learn language and for a world famous sense of humor. When we speak English, we all sound like Werner Herzog. We are Germans. Truly are the fearless bunch of motherfuckers. <laughs> yes, some of us actually do have sex with our closest relatives. It's an ancient German tradition mainly <laughs> practiced in a region called Saale. But that's another story. We are Germans. Our gross domestic product sums up to 3.7 trillion US dollars, which makes us the fourth largest economy in the world by far leading Europe. Our gold reserves are the second largest in the world. We are Germans. We started two world wars and almost won them both. We don't fear death.
Germany and say, well, you can now solve this problem by yourself, right? So, as you can see, the problem of, of, of this video is at the very end of the video. The first part, 99% of the video, is a regular satire which makes fun out of uh, Varoufakis when he was still the Minister of Finance. Uh, but the last part, here is the beginning. It's still not the beginning, this is the next step, and I will show you the first step actually very soon. Uh, but this is the beginning of the scandal in, in Germany. Uh, what is remarkable is that Yao, which is, I would say, the third step of this affair, uh, did take a lot of time uh, to, to, to create this scandal. I remember the day uh, when the video was published very well, because it was my birthday, <laughs> not on the 25th, it was published on the 25th of February, my birthday for those of you who want to know, or for, for NSA, it's on the 28th. And uh, I had a small party with friends because leftists also do have parties as well. And uh, I showed the video to my friends who still didn't see it, especially because the, the middle finger was showed at the festival we organized together. Uh, so a friend of mine, Igor Stix, with whom I published several books uh, uh, and uh, who was the co-organizer of the Subversive Festival, after watching the video he said, I'm surprised no one in Germany still didn't take the finger and use it against Varoufakis. One week or two weeks later, you have uh, Varoufakis at a TV show uh, where he's showed the finger, but actually not the whole context is shown, but only this part. Uh, so in a way, Yao was pretty lazy, so he just took out this finger and showed it to Varoufakis, and Varoufakis said it was, that's a quote, doctored. Uh, he, did, he never said he didn't show the finger, but he said the finger was manipulated. Uh, so, let's go on and let's see what is the context of the original finger if you didn't see it. Uh, it happened, I mean, I'll, I'll just explain it shortly. It happened two years before this year, 2013, at a festival called Subversive Festival, where I invited uh, Janis Varoufakis when he was still not the Minister of Finance, but uh, I very appreciated his text and especially his book Global Minotaur on Economy and he had a keynote lecture which is not this and he had a book promotion for 40 or 50 people where this happened and uh, yes, he showed the finger, we should say that, but let's see what's the context of the finger now. So this is from 2000, I mean what is interesting is actually What's interesting is that uh, no one from our team, from the Subversive Festival, did upload this video before. So it was uploaded, not, not originally on the 20th, but I would say in late, it was uploaded in late January. So Bernemann is the real genius who found it, you know, and we'll see later that he also did another brilliant thing. But let's see the context first. simply announce that it is defaulting, just like Argentina did, within the euro in January 2010, and stick the finger to Germany and say, well, you can now solve this problem by yourself, right? Why am I not, why was I not su supporting the idea that should, we should make an announcement that we're returning to the drama? In other words, why am I buying half of the Argentinian strategy, but not Okay, I mean, the rest is also very interesting and you can find the whole lecture on, on the internet. Uh, what, what is important, I think, to say is uh, where the manipulation started. Uh, when Yao showed, and that's the reason why I, I, I think we can speak about an attempt of a media coup d'etat, uh, in the sense of delegitimizing Varoufakis and then delegitimizing the Greek government and such, because if you have a Minister of Finance who is showing a finger, then obviously, uh, according to European uh, uh, traditional standards of diplomacy, he cannot be uh, someone who can be trusted. And that's something Schäuble repeated just after the scandal, Varoufakis cannot be trusted anymore. So finally they don't have Varoufakis as a Minister of Finance anymore, which is, I think, part of the whole story. Uh, but I think, uh, why should we speak of manipulation? Because uh, uh, 
Yao presented the video in his. I, I won't show Yao now because it will take too long, and I want to show Bernerman as well. Uh, Yao presented the video uh, uh, completely out of the context, uh, presenting uh, uh, Varoufakis as someone who showed the finger while being the Minister of Finance. So at no point did Yao say this is a finger showed two years ago. And I think always, I mean, if we are into semiotics, the context of a meaning is of uttermost importance. Without the context, we cannot know the meaning. And the context of the finger was that Varoufakis first wasn't the Minister of Finance yet, and second, that he didn't say actually that we should stick the finger to the to Germans. He said Germany, but he explained it that Germany actually means uh, a new bailout. So, what was created afterwards afterwards was some, was something that uh, really was uh, 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 very useful for Schäuble, Merkel, Juncker, and all the bosses of the European of the eurozone. Uh, in the sense of creating a tension between the German people and the Greek people, which is still the case. I mean, that's all the stories about the lazy Greeks, corruption, and so on, as if in Germany you don't have corruption, or in Croatia, or other uh, I'll show only the next video, and then we'll go into more theoretical stuff and the reflection on the current situation. Uh, because what I think is, what, what's remarkable is that, uh, uh, that the next video, that's uh, the last one by, by Bernerman, uh, shows actually that, uh, on the one hand, if we really live in a society which is uh, uh, governed by images and by signs, something that uh, the Italian philosopher Franco Berardi Bifo calls semi-capitalism, meaning that capitalism functions mainly through the accumulation of signs, uh, takes several examples, take, uh, take let's, let's say, the following example. Uh, I have uh, shares in Siemens, for example, and then uh, I tell Karl Heinz Delvo that she, he should buy uh, shares of Siemens because of the, let's say, the recent scandal uh, about uh, uh, Merkel uh, giving the permission to NSA to spy on Siemens. So, for example, I can predict that the shares of Siemens will rise. I say it to him, he will, like, because I have a lecture, so he cannot speak very loudly, tell it uh, uh, to the next person, and the next per person will tell it to the next person, and when it comes to the last person there, it maybe won't be Siemens anymore, but Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> and it really happens like this on the markets that, you know, that rumors, uh, uh, speculation, predictions actually uh, 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 govern the, the real price. So in this sense I would claim that what we have today is actually that the virtual economy is actually uh, uh, leading the game and that virtual economy has an effect on, on real economy as well. Uh, I, I'll give you another, uh, another example uh, which is an example from, from a movie uh, called Being There from the 70s. I don't know if you watched it. Uh, it's a movie with Peter Sellers uh, in one of his best roles, uh, where he was his whole life a gardener for a very rich capitalist. So Peter Sellers, who is called Chancy, Chancy Gardener, never left uh, the, 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 the house of, of his boss. Uh, and once, one day his boss dies. And the gardener goes out of the house with one suitcase, and uh, he comes in front on a street in front of a, a, a shop or grocery, and a lady with a car, with a huge car, hits him. The lady is very afraid that God, the gardener might sue her, so she invites him at their home. Uh, what we soon find out is that the home is even bigger than the previous home uh, where the gardener was a gardener, and so we find out that the husband of the lady is one of the richest Americans who is very close to the president of U.S., and they have lunch with the gardener. And of course the gardener is only speaking about the garden because he, he was never in the real world uh, outside. And the, 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 the rich capitalist uh, thinks or mistakes him as a guy from Wall Street. Uh, why? Because uh, Chancy is speaking all the time, uh, you know, if you have a crisis, after summer you have winter and it is very natural that you have a crisis but after winter there comes spring and so on and then again you have the cycles of the financial system and what is interesting is that the, 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 this capitalist guy invites the American president at home and says you know I have this crazy guy who is you know I, I don't know a financial genius you should speak with him and when the, when the president of US comes uh, Chancy 
Peter Sellers repeats the same, you know. My suggestion for, for exiting the crisis is actually, you know, you have cycles and so on and so on. I mean, what I already said. And then the American president goes on television and tells it to the whole nation. And that's the end of the movie. I mean, the end is actually brilliant. This is not the end, but the end is uh, another metaphysical story for which we don't have time now. But uh, what, what, what the example from the movie shows is actually that such discursive narrations can have effects on real economy. I'll take another example. I mean, what, what's, what's the reason why Varoufakis' motorbike, Varoufakis' letter jacket uh, from, from, from uh, when he first went to London, Varoufakis' scarf, Varoufakis' t-shirt, uh, Tsipras without a tie, why is it so important? I mean, what is remarkable actually is that really each time you see such an example, you can see that markets react. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's the whole cliche which is floating around that each time you have markets that react. So, for example, let's take the following, uh, the following thought experiment. Uh, you know when Tsipras' first visit to a foreign uh, politician was uh, to Renzi in Italy. And when he was there, they were together like this. And Renzi gave him, you can find photographs of it, he gave him uh, a tie. And Tsipras was very surprised, smiling all the time as he does, but that's another story, I think, that we should ask his PR why he's smiling when he's meeting Merkel, for example. I mean, does Merkel really deserve that Tsipras smiles at her? I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, at this point, Tsipras said and promised to Renzi, when Greece will come out of the crisis, I will put the tie. And now imagine the following situation. Tomorrow, today, Today, the Greek government announces a press conference for tomorrow, and tomorrow Tsipras comes with a tie. I mean, we could really predict, it's just a thought experiment, that the markets would react on such a fact. <laughs> and if you go on, I, I, unfortunately, I didn't find it, but uh, I mean, I didn't have time to, I'm usually not using computers in my lectures, uh, but the last days, uh, there is a new scandal with Varoufakis, just because he had a funny shirt. And then you see Financial Times, uh, Bloomberg, Business Insider, all the very serious uh, financial uh, journals uh, are writing about the t-shirt of, of the Minister of Finance. And then you have even Tsipras who is reacting on it and saying, you know, maybe Varoufakis has a bad dress code, but he is a serious economist. So what I wanted to say is actually that a lesson that we can draw, that we can, that, that we can learn from all this, uh, and that's why the middle finger is still important, I think, although we should slowly or quickly pass to more important stuff, but let's just take the first lesson. I think the first lesson is, if we live in the era of semi-capitalism, of capitalism which mainly functions not through accumulation of commodities, but accumulation of science, where actually you have really values which have no equivalent in the real world, then it can also be used against the very system. And I think Berneman did it. And there comes a genius, I think, uh, who completely uh, switches, gives a new twist to the story again. So I would say this is, this is the, the, the third step. The first step was the actual finger at the subversive festival. The second was Yao's manipulation. And this is Burnham's manipulation. Lieber Günther Jauch, lieber ARD, liebe Bildredaktion, einmal bitte tief durchatmen. Da nehmen Sie mal Stuhl. Setzen Sie sich hin. Sie müssen jetzt... Sie müssen jetzt ganz, ganz stark sein. Okay, does everyone understand? Lustige Sprüche klopfen, investigative Fragen fragen, 
Der nette Kerl von nebenan sein. Die Massen begeistern. Jeden Tag bleiben Moderatoren dabei auf der Strecke. Wir haben uns gefragt, wie können wir diesen Menschen helfen? Die Neo Magazin Fernsehnothilfe. Wir vom Neo Magazin sind zwar eine kleine Sendung, aber wir helfen gern. Auch großen Sendungen. 5,2 Millionen Zuschauer haben am Sonntag in der ARD die große Volkstalkshow von Günter Jauch gesehen. 18,4 Prozent Marktanteil. Zu Gast war unter anderem der griechische Finanzminister Janis Varoufakis. Und ein großer Skandal. Ein YouTube-Video von einem Kongress in Kroatien im Jahr 2013, in dem Janis Varoufakis, wenn ich das richtig verstanden habe, uns Deutschen den Stinkefinger gezeigt hat. Umso mehr sind die Deutschen zuweilen irritiert, in welcher Art gerade Sie auch äh, gegenüber unserem Land aufgetreten sind. Varoufakis will den Griechen neues Selbstvertrauen geben. Greece should simply announce that it is defaulting. Und steht für klare Botschaften, besonders an Deutschland. And stick the finger to Germany and say, well, you can now solve this problem by yourself. Schockierend. Besonders schockiert ist aber Janis Varoufakis, weil er sich einfach nicht daran erinnern kann, auf der Konferenz den Stinkefinger gezeigt zu haben. Das will ich Sie doch etwas ganz Einfaches sagen. Dieses Video ist falsch. Das ist so montiert worden. Ich habe so etwas nie gemacht. Ich schäme mich dafür, dass man mir das zutraut. Das Foto ist von der Konferenz, sehr wohl. Aber der Finger ist rein montiert worden. Das sage ich Ihnen ohne jeden Zweifel fest zu. Und nehmen Sie es einfach hin. Das hat es nicht gegeben. Aber ich hab das auch Können wir vielleicht noch mal ganz kurz äh, den Ausschnitt sehen, den Janis Varoufakis uns den Schwingefinger zeigt? Ganz kurz in zum Test. Within the Euro in January 2010 and stick the finger to Germany and say, well, you can now solve this problem by yourself. Right? Wo, äh, da war jetzt der, wo ist denn da jetzt der Finger gewesen? Da war ja gar kein Stinkefinger drin, meine Damen und Herren. Ist der Finger also wirklich fake? Aber wer fällt denn sowas? Wer, das, das kann doch nur... Also es kann aller, ich, das Einzige, was ich mir vorstellen kann, dass das eventuell eine kleine gebührenfinanzierte Loser-Show war. Und so haben wir es gemacht. Ja, wir haben ja Anfang Februar diesen Wie vor Warufakis Song vorbereitet und da brauchten wir noch... Originalmaterial vom, vom echten Varoufakis und das gab es damals noch nicht so und da mussten wir halt was suchen. Und das war dann, was war das, ein Kongress in Kroatien, zweit, zweit, äh, Zagreb 2013. Und da gab es tatsächlich so ein paar Passagen drin, die für unser Video ganz interessant waren. If now the Euro goes, we're going to have a massive depression in Germany and stagflation in the rest of Europe. Ach, ich mein, wie kriegt man nun einen Draht nach Kroatien? Das ist nicht leicht. Srećom tečo govori da nas je usnjivati iz Hrvatske i njenu prijateljicu iz Zagreba, koja je radila za Super Z festival 2013. I da, pozdravimo vas, Bog Nina, Bog Dina. Bog Dina! Bog Njemačka, Bog Neo Magazine Royale, pozdravljam Guntera Jauka i Janisa Varuhanska i žao mi je. Das war kroatisch. Okay, this is, uh, I mean, the, the video is very long and we don't have so, so much time, uh, but yeah, you can watch it at home. Uh, I mean, it already illustrates the things which I want to say. Uh, the first thing about what I want to say is that I don't know, although I was the director of the Subversive so Festival, I don't know the girl. So this is also part of the show. Uh, and it's great if you ask me, I, as someone who organized the thing, I was also smiling at, at this footage, like going to Croatia, really finding someone who will speak Croatian and pretending that he worked for the festival. Uh, and I think this, if you go to Germany, and I'm quite often in Germany, and my sister works in Germany and speaks to ordinary people and so on, I think the brilliance of this video is that a lot of people today in Germany still think this is the truth. And that's quite funny, and, that's, and I think we from the left should use this example to see how we can fight. And in this sense, the Thai and, you know, all this pop icon model of Varoufakis, mainly Varoufakis, but then also others, uh, is, is important. I mean, what we can learn from it is that media is manipulating it. Uh, but since I don't have much time to, to really give a semiotical analysis of all these examples, I will switch to the second 
second thesis, and that's much more serious stuff. Uh, so if, in this first case, a media coup was attempted, which didn't really succeed, but it succeeded now, afterwards, uh, where all this was actually used against Varoufakis, and that's one of the reasons, one, not the, not the main one, why Varoufakis resigned as well, uh, because Tsipras realized that the people from the Eurogroup won't negotiate with him, but it would be better to have Tsakalotos. The other reason is that Varoufakis uh, couldn't sign the agreement at the beginning, of course, because he didn't believe in it. But that's another story where we can end up. Uh, but my, my, my second point, uh, my first point of today would be that uh, if it was a media coup, uh, we can still use it and Bernemann is a brilliant example of subversion, the term we, 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 we coined, I mean not we but Gramsci, but we uh, again put it uh, in, the, in, the, in the game and in the discourse of the left in 2008 when we founded the festival. Uh, but my second point is that a real coup d'etat in Greece happened at the beginning of July. So I arrived to Greece uh, several days before the referendum, uh, and it was uh, remarkable because on all the streets, uh, from Ammonia to Syntagma Square, if you walk, would walk all around Athens, you would see mainly young people, which is an important fact, uh, uh, giving you leaflets with, with an office sign. Uh, and the whole Greek society was actually mobilized around the referendum. Uh, but, as always when a referendum happens in the European Union, it is not something which happens only in one country, but it's something which happens on the European level. So already at the beginning uh, you could hear uh, the leaders of, of, of the European Union uh, pressure, making pressure on the Greek people not to vote or not to vote no. They went even so far to interpret the question of the referendum. So there was never a question at the referendum in Greece which said, should we exit the Eurozone or should we stay? Such question never existed, but it was only should we uh, accept new austerity measures or not. Uh, never, nonetheless, all the leaders uh, of the European Union, including Hollande, uh, Juncker, Schäuble and so on, said that this is a referendum about exiting the, the Eurozone. And actually, uh, what we have here is, is, is something uh, which uh, the French psychoanalytical theorist uh, Jacques Lacan, although I'm not Lacanian, but I like this uh, particular example, uh, says when you are in front, in front of an alternative which says your freedom or your life, uh, if you choose freedom, you lose both immediately. You lose freedom and your life, and if you choose life, you will have a life deprived of freedom. And I think this was precisely uh, the, the, the false alternative uh, which uh, the Greek people had during the referendum. So it was, you can choose your freedom, which is exiting the Eurozone, but then you will immediately lose both, your freedom and your life, probably, but that's another question. Or you can use life, which is staying in the Eurozone, but you will be deprived of freedom, as we can see now with the third bailout and the conditions of the agreement. Of course, there is a twist. Lacan said the only proof of freedom that you can have in, the, in this condition uh, is precisely to choose death, for there you show that you have freedom of choice. And what, what's interesting, although I, I, I can imagine that Juncker uh, doesn't read Lacan, it's interesting that uh, just before the, the, the referendum, uh, Juncker had a very symptomatic quote. Uh, so he said, don't commit suicide because you are afraid of death. Meaning, suicide was, of course, the ohi, the no, and death was new agreement. So in a way, it was Juncker himself who admitted that, uh, that uh, the new agreement is death. So don't commit suicide because you're afraid of death. And here we come back actually to Lacan when he says that uh, uh, choosing suicide is actually an act of freedom because you, you, you actually have a choice. Uh, in ancient Greece, uh, slaves were perceived as slaves precisely because they, didn't, they never committed suicide because they were afraid of death. And that's the reason why they were not, among other things, perceived as, 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 as real people. But the situation, I mean, what Juncker said reminds us also of a drug dealer who can say to you, don't commit suicide because you are afraid of death. It actually means a drug dealer who gives you drugs, but he is very happy that you will take more drugs and more drugs and not the final shot. Uh, so this was the situation uh, before the referendum. 
And before the referendum, a real economical coup d'etat happened, which is, which is very similar actually to the things which happened in Chile uh, during Allende. So if you remember Chile, it was Nixon who invited Kissinger and uh, the director of the CIA, and they had a meeting even before Allende came to power. It was already clear that Allende will come to power, and Nixon said, okay, we have two choices. One choice is a hard coup, this hard coup is uh, a military coup d'etat. And we have a choice of a soft coup d'etat. And Nixon described it in the words, let the economy scream. And you know the rest, probably, what happened in Chile and so on. And I would say something very similar happened in Greece. Uh, because the first thing what the European Central Bank did is actually to, to force the Greek government, the Minister of Finance, uh, to put capital controls in Greece which is the reason why the banks were closed for more than two weeks all the time. And then we have also a third step, a third installment of, of I would say, the first step of the coup d'etat was just before the referendum when you had the usual pressure, which always happens, and you can say, okay, there, that, that's nothing remarkable, it happens all the time on the European level. But then you had something remarkable which didn't happen uh, when the previous Greek governments announced the referendum, or it didn't happen in any other country of Europe, it's capital controls. So imagine, and then we come to the third step, but let's first for, for, for the beginning imagine that in Germany you have the banks closed for two weeks. Could you imagine what would happen? Mass hysteria, fear, uh, people who are standing also, like in Greece, in queues to get money from the banks and so on. So I mean, when Varoufakis says, this is terrorism. I completely agree with him because the definition of terror is to provoke fear. That the point of the European Central Bank, the goal of the European Central Bank was to provoke fear so that the, that, that the voters at the referendum don't vote no to new austerity measures. And the third thing which happened after the people voted, uh, voted no is that uh, the MPs, the MPs uh, had to, the MPs uh, in the Greek parliament uh, had to sign a paper, the paper of the new agreement, to vote on it in only 24 hours and the paper consisted of 1,000 pages. So how can you read it at all? And then of course there are other parts of the new agreement which is for example the privatization fund which, would con which should control the, the privatization of the rest of the public assets in Greece. The first idea was to place it in Luxembourg, now we know why and who is in the board. Uh, but now it will be in Athens, which is not really uh, a better thing. So to slowly, uh, to slowly conclude, because time is running up and uh, we want a discussion as well, but I hope we will take 10 minutes from the next lecture because we, we started 10 minutes later, and I, found, I, I, I hope if Athena is here that she won't, she won't mind and we will give her next 10 minutes. Uh, but because now we come actually to, to, to much more serious stuff. Uh, this is the discussion uh, uh, about the internal situation in Syriza now, and we cannot avoid to speak about it. Uh, so on the one hand you have the position that Tsipras and the government didn't have a choice. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a position that from the very beginning they had a choice. On the one hand, as we know, even before Syriza became a political, a united political party, even during the time when there were a coalition, so it was five years ago, uh, there is something which we might characterize as left Europeanism, uh, which was the main ideology of, of, of Syriza, uh, in the sense, yes, we can make a change within the Euro, and we can force the European institutions uh, to come to a mutually agreeable agreement, or beneficially uh, a agreement which both sides will agree upon. And this was the main course of Syriza up until now. But there was also another side which is now represented mainly by the left platform uh, and by people like Kostas Lapavitsas mainly, uh, who are in favor of the exit. Uh, so recently, uh, one of the members of, of the left platform, uh, Statis Kovelakis, uh, wrote an article for the magazine Jacobin, uh, where he said that the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems of Syriza, among others, other problems are the, uh, the level of democracy inside of the political party, connection with the grassroots movements and so on, that one of the biggest ideological problems, which is also a strategical problem, was what he calls left Europeanism of Syriza. 
uh, which, as I said, mainly means uh, uh, a strategy that consisted uh, in the belief that Europe can be changed from inside and that we have to stick to the, uh, to the Eurozone. Now, of course, today we can see that uh, precisely by signing the, the third memorandum, uh, Syriza will get rid of all the plans uh, stated in the so-called Thessaloniki program, uh, which means new privatization of public assets, uh, uh, reform of the labor market, reform of the pension system, and actually, uh, in other words, losing sovereignty. And this is all now at the table, and it is all, I agree with that, yes? Excuse me? Would you please keep the discussion in mind? Yes, I have. I've, yes, it's almost 10 minutes. Thank you. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. We have room to interrupt. Um, okay, give me five minutes if you want. Okay, you will have the first question. <laughs> okay, let me just, uh, just end. I, can, or I have several more points which are very important, I think. Uh, I agree with Kuvelakis when it comes to the critique of, and I will speak very fast, I hope it will be fine with you. Uh, I agree with his critique of left Europeanism, but I don't agree if you read the article, or you should read it in Jacobin, when he speaks that the only solution for Syriza now is, he said it explicitly, is anti-Europeanist strategy, which means not only exiting the Eurozone, but it means also exiting the European Union, and this means actually demolishing the, the project of the European Union. I don't agree with that. I agree with what La 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 Costas Lapavica says, it's actually we have to exit the Eurozone. Yes, I agree with that to some degree, of course, although, although Greece is not prepared. But I don't agree that uh, Europeanism as such uh, still doesn't make any sense. Uh, I think the biggest mistake of Syriza was uh, what, uh, what uh, Marx uh, uh, said in his opening pages of the 18th Brumaire, where he said that uh, uh, unlike the French Revolution, which looked to the past, the new social revolution of the 19th century should look to the future. And he said, and now I will uh, make a parallel with Syriza, he said, the social revolution of the 19th century can only create its poetry from the future, not from the past. It cannot begin its own work until it, it has erased all its superstitious regard for the past. And I would say precisely this, this small paragraph uh, can, be, uh, can be put in relation to both to both options which are now presented as an alternative, either staying in the Eurozone or exiting the Eurozone and exiting the, the, the European Union. So on the one hand, left Europeanism, on the other hand, Kuvelaki's anti-Europeanist strategy. I would say if you just read the paragraph again, you will see that both options are actually doing the same. Marx's thesis is that the French Revolution actually looked to the Roman past because they needed the necess necessary illusion of the past in order to create liberty, equality, and so on. Uh, but I would say the same goes for, for, for the one wave of Syriza. This is the wave of Tsipras, where they believed they could, uh, uh, they could have a reference to the old uh, ideals of Europe, not of European Union. But I would say the same problem goes for Kuvelakis, because if really Greece exits not only the Eurozone, but exits the European Union, it is not the start of a solution, it is the start of a problem. And we could speak about it more and more, but just to finally conclude, uh, I think what, because all this discussion should take hours and they are really very serious, uh, especially the discussion about Syriza today and what's the future of Syriza, uh, but I think there is one lesson that is very important, at least for me, and I've seen it. It's an illness, actually. It's an illness of the left, which is not a new illness. And Walter Benjamin characterized this illness as left melancholy. So most of the people who spent their time in Greece, or who didn't spend the time in Greece, but they were following articles about Syriza and about this disaster and so on, started to speak ab about a betrayal, about a capitulation, uh, about Tsipras as a traitor and so on and so on. And I think it completely misses the point because those are moral categories applied uh, on a very uh, a serious situation. And when you go into moralism, it's, as Lapavica says, it's a game where you will lose. You cannot win in moralism. But what you can see with the left is actually that they are really, today, that the left actually has this sickness of left-wing melancholy. And left-wing melancholy, uh, according to Benjamin, 
is this sticking to an old idea in the sense even those who believed in Syriza are now sticking to the idea of capitulation, betrayal and so on instead of looking to the poetry of the future as Marx says and I think this is the biggest problem and to, 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 to conclude it brings us back to Freud's classical and I think this is my proposition for, day, uh, for today for, for the main proposition I would say it brings us back to Freud's classical paper on melancholia, melancholia where he makes the distinction between trauer arbeit on the one hand and melancholy. So on the one hand you have mourning, on the other hand you have melancholy. So imagine a subject who was in love and who, who just had a breakup, for example. The melancholic will stick to the object of love. He will like, I idealize his loss. He will say, oh, that, is, that was the most beautiful girlfriend, boyfriend, I will never meet someone with such characteristics and so on. And if he cannot get over the lost object, what will happen is he will internalize the loss and he will become a melancholic subject. Unlike that, trauer arbeit means that you can really perceive that the, lost, that the object is lost and we, you have to face the lost object. And I think we have to face today, to go on with this parallel and conclude, we have to face that Syriza didn't succeed with its European strategy, but I don't think this is the end of Syriza yet. And I, I conclude here and leave space for discussion. Thanks.